morning, everybody. All right, so I'd like to thank Alice Novak, um, Ed Bridges, uh, Angie Dodson, and the team here at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts for inviting me to be here um, and for also organizing this symposium. I also want to thank the Alabama State Council on the Arts and the Alabama Humanities Foundation and others for their support, their financial support um, for this event. It's really my honor uh, to contribute to Bearing Witness Art of Alabama. Okay, so since the 19th century, the visual culture of Alabama has been critical to the moral conscience of the nation and the world. It is one of the states that we globally turn to to educate ourselves and reflect upon the definitions of justice, pain, and possibility. It is a touchstone state for understanding our nation's past and the potential for its present and future. As an art and cultural historian, I have come regularly to Alabama to do just that educate myself about the past of slavery and its ongoing afterlives that reach out nationwide. In turn, what I study, perceive, and process goes back home with me where I teach thousands of students about African American studies and its visual manifestations. I'm going to show you a couple of images for historical context from the 19th century. This is slave auction in Montgomery, Alabama from around 1850. And uh, the disunited states or uh, the Southern Confederacy. Um, and I'm showing these to you. These are uh, both historical documents and uh, political cartoons. Um, and in this particular document, the state of Alabama is personified in the fourth man from the left who says, Alabama proclaims that cotton is king and the rest of the Confederacy must obey that sovereign. So this was inked in 1861 on the eve of the Civil War, and we can see evidence of the pro-slavery and segregationist leadership in the state in hundreds of visual and text-based documents that profess to a pride in anti-blackness. As strong and even more resilient is the counteraction to this deeply rooted culture of inhumanity and greed. On this recognition of the state's bicentennial, I'm grateful for this opportunity to share some of my research about artists who have used their creativity and passion to extend ideas of civil rights and freedom to a greater population and towards the goal of justice. Alabama is rich with these resources of resistance, beauty, and pride across all artistic forms um, including Sun Ra, Nat King Cole, Wilson Pickett, and Jason Isbell in music, Booker T. Washington, Angela Davis, or No Hurston, Harper Lee in literature, um, and in the visual arts, influence of artists from Alabama and the visual legacy of images made about Alabama have produced a discourse of knowledge, wonder, and invention that we are invigorated and inspired by today. Although the production and influence of Alabama's visual art is extensive, today I am limiting myself to speaking about just a handful whose work speaks to the civil rights movement in Alabama. Over the past several years, I've been going to Birmingham to study the civil rights movement and work on an ongoing project about the work of photographer Chris McNair. While conducting research for one of my African American Studies courses, I came across McNair's name, who was mentioned primarily as the father of Denise McNair, one of the four girls murdered by a group of Klansmen at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham on September 15, 1963. I was not already familiar with his work, and I wanted to find out more about him and his art. Jewel Chris McNair graduated from Tuskegee Institute in 1942, where he worked with legendary photographer Prentice Herman Polk, known as P.H. Polk, who was the chief photographer for the Institute and the university for over 45 years. 
Polk instilled in McNair the principles of pride in oneself and pride in one's people that remains an inherent tradition um, and value of the historically black colleges and university system. This HBCU tradition was stylized by Polk, and we can see the direct influence of this visual philosophy in McNair's work. I just want to show you um, a couple of images of the thousands and thousands and thousands of images that we have been gifted um, by P.H. Polk. Um, he took a number of really fantastic photographs of George Washington Carver. Um, and then he also uh, took pictures of uh, co-eds. Um, this is the Alpha Phi Gamma uh, debutantes uh, from 1938, also taken by P.H. Polk. So Polk is known for his wide range of photographs of life on campus that include pictures of the innovative experimentation of groundbreaking, groundbreaking scientist George Washington Carver to portraits of campus leaders through angelically costumed co-eds, images of high class respectability and the dignity of intellectual curiosity. Um, these were the order of the day in the early to mid 20th century um, to combat derogatory images of blacks prevalent in popular culture. At that same time um, that Polk was making these portraits to inspire and reflect Negro uplift, he also created a parallel archive of portraits taken of the local black re residents who were not employed by the Institute or enrolled as students. The duality of showing a middle class ideal and the popular reality of black life is a feature that we can also trace to McNair's oeuvre. Okay, um, I'm showing you here Bowling Team um, uh, by McNair. Um, in 1962, McNair opened his own photography studio at 45 Sixth Avenue in Birmingham. He took formal portraits of Birmingham residents who were black and white and worked on location shooting uh, construction projects, yearbook pictures, graduations, family reunions, and other recreational events for the community. He first began publishing his photographs for a national audience in August 1963 when Ebony Magazine published an extended excerpt from King's canonical letter from a Birmingham jail written in April of that year. McNair was present for the arrest and release of King and civil rights leader Reverend Ralph, Ralph Abernathy just four days later. Um, so this is the title page of that article. Um, and then I want to show you the layout that features two of um, McNair's photographs. Okay, and I've circled them here. The publication of two of McNair's photographs show his sense of formal composition and his willingness to get in front of everyone else in order to get an unobstructed view for the right shot. And I'll show you some details. Um, this is the photo at the bottom left. We see Coretta Scott King and Juanita Odessa Jones Abernathy, the wives of King and Abernathy, escorted by Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth at the Birmingham jail. The three look elated, having just passed through the containing gates. McNear could have cropped the photo to just show these three figures, but he left the policeman on the left uh, in the shot who we see through the chain links. His eyes are blocked by a metal pipe in the gate's construction. The line of this pipe moves our eye directly to King's eyes, covered in stylish cat eye sunglasses as she walks forward toward us. The weighted branches above hang lowest over the exiting visitors, drawing our attention to them. Their position at the bottom half of the photo, feet cut off by the right corner, gives us the sense that they are moving quickly out of their situation. It isn't hard to imagine that the women are looking at us, allowing us to share in their moment of relief and joy. Um, 
Um, in the photo that's uh, featured on the right of that page that I showed you in the uh, initial layout, McNair shows us the moment of King's and Abernathy's release and reunion with attorney Orzel Billingsley on the right and Reverend Shuttlesworth on the left. King stands in the center of the photograph glowing in his white dress shirt. His stubbled face and wrinkled pants show the toll of the past few days. Coats in hand, King and Abernathy, who smiles brightly by King's side, are ready to continue their struggle as they pass through the gates towards freedom. These dramatic moments had national and personal significance for McNair because they were happening in his hometown and included in collaborative planning uh, uh, with local leaders. They were also national and international news of the daily trials of the civil rights movement. Um, on June 11, 1963, McNair was commissioned by Ebony to cover efforts towards the integration of the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. What took place that day is now known as the infamous stand in the schoolhouse door when Alabama Governor George Wallace refused to let aspiring college students James Hood and Vivian Malone register for classes. Uh, McNair's photo from that day includes this striking image of Wallace blocking the entrance of the registration office through the white wires of a window. The design of the window offers a sense of capture at the governor uh, as if he is trapped by his belief in segregation instead of the blacks that he wanted to exclude from state education. His wide-eyed look of anticipation through the gate toward the arrival of Hood and Malone recall the look of a caged animal and heightens a sense of desperation in his self-imposed separation. A handheld camera hovering on the left edge of the photograph increases the tension, the cameraman at the ready to document Wallace's next move. McNair also printed this photograph of Malone and Hood at a press conference after Governor Wallace's stand in the schoolhouse door. McNair seems to have caught Malone's eye as she looks towards the camera with a smile. The people all around her, including Hood, have markedly different facial expressions. Although they seem to have made it through the day's trauma, the students are still remarkably vulnerable. And I'm struck by the pressure of this moment um, with Malone looking at us, right? The microphone is held under her chin and she's expected to give a statement to the press at this instant and she remains composed somehow in the middle of a very threatening situation. Um, for publication, however, Ebony chose a different photograph. Um, we have, uh, I'm showing you the detail of it on the right, this image of Hood and Malone standing together, elegantly dressed, as movement activists always were, um, without Wallace or any sign of distress or state conflict. McNair took this photograph on a day after the registration happened, and it recalls photos of Polk's proud Tuskegee co-eds. The moment chosen for Ebony viewers represents black triumph in the civil rights movement instead of white aggression. And um, I didn't know for other people who um, studied the Johnson publications, um, Ebony didn't often uh, publish any, any sense of violence or conflict at all. In fact, in the history and the journal, of the photojournalism and the journalism of Ebony Magazine, this is the only representation that was published of the stand in the schoolhouse door. Three months after the schoolhouse door, on September 15th, 1963, Denise McNair, Chris and Maxine's uh, his wife, Maxine's only child at the time, was killed by white supremacists um, while attending Sunday services at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Two men threw a bomb into a, a window of the church, killing three girls and blinding a fourth. Um, and McNair, uh, three other girls and blinding a fourth. McNair took two photographs on that day. One is of this welcome sign out of the, outside of the church. Um, and this is the other, taken across the street of the corner of the church where the blast took place. 
The bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church was a defining moment in the civil rights movement for millions of people. For Chris and Maxine, it was much more than that. It profoundly changed their lives in a way that they could never fully recover from, in the way that parents can never recover from the death of a child. It also put them in the spotlight as public figures. After this tragic event, Chris McNair became one of the premier photographers of the area, documenting both the civil rights movement and everyday life. There's much more to say um, about McNair um, from my research into his life as an artist, but I, I do want to say that if there's anyone in the audience that is interested in funding a really fantastic project, there's definitely a need um, with the archives. Um, Chris died um, quite recently. There's hundreds of thousands of negatives. Um, there are multiple exhibitions and possible publications that can come out of his archive. And I am in absolute regular um, communication with the family. So please see me if you or someone you know wants to really dive into this treasure trove of Birmingham history. So the aesthetics and activism in photography from the civil rights movement rolls deep in Alabama. Um, I'm thrilled to have met the legendary photographer Chester Higgins in person here uh, yesterday evening and I look forward to hearing from him this afternoon. Mr. Higgins is a disciple of P.H. Polk and has been influenced by many sources that have led to his unforgettable photographs within the state of Alabama but also all over the African continent, the US, South America, and Europe to document a global African presence. Originally from New Brockton, Alabama, Higgins studied at Tuskegee University, was a staff photographer for the New York Times for over 40 years, and has published several books of his art. As an artist, his career has engaged both photojournalism and art photography. His goal, in his words, and I'm quoting, uh, to free the image from time, to free it to a level of universality, has made a powerful impact on his viewers and helped project an image of the civil rights movement and black Americans that connects internationally. So I want to show you uh, really three images, a few images from here, his career, and I will not say too much because the artist will speak to us shortly himself. Um, however, it's, it's very important that if I'm standing here talking about our, the civil rights movement in Alabama that I have to mention um, Chester Higgins' work. Um, I wanted to just um, show this. This is him um, a little bit younger with P.H. Polk. Uh, Mr. Higgins was a part of the civil rights movement as artist and activist. His photographs show him as a participant who was able to see and document the other people gathered um, at the event from within. In civil rights rally taken here in Montgomery, he presents an intimate moment in the rain where men and women are still watching and listening to a speaker. They look upward, optimistic, focused, and concerned as they stand at attention. They demonstrate care for each other through their shared umbrellas. They are likely aware of Higgins' presence, but see him as one of them, whose work in the movement is a part of their larger purpose for social change. In this portrait of Southern Christian Leadership Coalition worker Patricia Dunham, Higgins portrays the hope, beauty, and youthful potential of the civil rights workers in the movement. Sitting with her hands around an open book, Higgins seems to have caught Dunham paused in her studies as she looks out beyond the picture frame. Maybe she's on a quick break between classes, or she's heard a sound that's just gotten her attention. The horizontal lines of the stairs behind her direct our eyes to her distant gaze. Combined with the optimism of her expression, the stairs signal the upward goals of the movement and transformative hope of those engaged in the study of black pride and political change. Um, okay. Hang on. This is what I want us to look at. Okay. 
Um, here in student protest, Higgins documents this group of mostly male activists who've gathered to demand racial equality. With hands in their pockets and arms and hands folded, they show respect for the young man speaking into the megaphone. We see their strength in numbers and their earnestness for the cause that they represent. Uh, with hands in their pockets, kneeling, standing, and smoking, their variety of poses indicates a spectrum of feeling from nervousness to confidence. And Higgins' photo shows their bravery and vulnerability at once, all a part of their larger commitment. Also in Alabama during the late 1960s, another gathering, a series of gatherings was happening with women at the center of the action, collaboration, and protest through quilts. The Freedom Quilting Bee began in 1966, extending a model of cooperative labor and creativity from the 19th century for the social, political, and economic advancement of black Americans. And I want to provide some uh, information here uh, by way of context for this really remarkable project. Um, I'm going to show you a portrait of uh, Francis, Francis Xavier uh, Walter, um, an Episcopal priest and sixth generation Alabamian um, who came to the Black Belt to investigate whites' harassment of blacks for participating in the civil rights movement. He had recently become director of the Selma Interreligious Project, a civil rights organization that promoted economic and social freedoms for its black residents. Using the project's entire annual budget of $16,000, Walter contacted civil rights groups, foundations, and federal employees for support. He intervened in the violence against black Alabamians by giving them rides in his car, uh, to voter registration booths, and supplementing educational resources by distributing textbooks that were donated by sympathizers uh, based in Detroit. During the first year of his mission to create a black voting base in the area, Walter took depositions from uh, black residents about their efforts to register to vote and participate in public demonstrations against racial exclusion. Most of the residents were sharecroppers who had suffered repercussions for their actions at the hands of racists. White residents who ran them out of their homes they leased uh, rendered them without jobs and homes. Uh, they were threatened with imprisonment for bank, loads, bank loans that were suddenly due, um, a strategy used to lock up blacks who were viewed as troublesome so that they could not demonstrate or vote, and then of course they were used uh, for convict uh, labor. Uh, Walter explains, we were under the naive notion that the FBI would take this data from the depositions and prosecute people under the new civil rights law that said you cannot evict somebody from rental property because he has registered to vote or was in a demonstration or attempted to exercise his constitutional rights, end of quote. Um, of course, he was wrong. And so he came up with another idea for empowerment. By chance, he saw three quilts hanging on a backyard clothesline in Wilcox County near the home of Miss Ora McDaniels. He then came up with the idea to sell the quilts at auction in New York City, where they would sell for much more than the $5 price that Miss McDaniels sold, Daniel sold her quilts for. After communicating with McDaniels and the community of quilters in Wilcox, the quilters agreed to be paid $10 per quilt up front, allow the quilts to be sold in New York, and then collect the additional proceeds. Okay, so here is a, a poster of uh, the first quilt auction uh, in 1966. The success of this plan encouraged quilters to take quilts off of their beds and out of their closets to give to Walter. It also invigorated a new collective effort for quilting. Many women, women participated, from the highly skilled to the lesser skilled, so that the entire group could share in the benefits. As historian Nancy Callahan describes, the quilts they made, rhythmic and romantic by name, the patterns reflected images of the faithful and long-honored elements of Black Wilcox society, the people, traditions, occupations, work implements, the natural kingdom, outer space, and the Bible. 
They were grandmother's choice, pine burr, monkey wrench, double wedding ring, and co coats of many colors. Overwhelmed by the enthusiasm for the quilt, Walter set up a co-op in 1966 called the Freedom Quilting Bee. Um, about 60 quilters met together in Antioch Baptist Church uh, in Camden. And at that first meeting, um, as the official Freedom Quilting Bee, the women elected officers and adopted a charter. And Estelle B. Witherspoon was elected as the first bee president. At the first couple of auctions, quilts sold for between $20 and $70, a financial victory in itself. And these were the highest prices ever paid for a black belt quilt in history at the time of their selling. But by the end of the second auction, the quilt netted $2,065. The money was used to pay for washing machines, telephones, front porches, indoor bathrooms, furniture, clothes, high school graduation rings, and college tuition. By the end of 1966, the co-op made a profit of over $5,000, and this was just the beginning of the financial success and fame of the quilting bee. In 1968, a designer for Bloomingdale's approached the co-op with an order uh, for $20,000 um, to make quilts with Egyptian cottons, paisleys, and velvets instead of local scrap fabric. Bloomingdale's took out a full page ad in the New York Times in 1969 to advertise the collaboration between the quilting bee and the department store. So I'm showing you here a New York Times ad for Bloomingdale's published June 1st, 1969, and I'm going to read that text to you. Dance, gypsy, in a romance of mingled colorings, or linger happily at home in the splendor of silk organdy. A billow of patchwork floats to the floor from a see-through top of navy blue, the full-length charmer. Prices are $55 to $75. I'll uh, show you the second one from the same year. Um, uh, later that month, the text reads, Come to our patchwork paradise. See quilts, coverlets, pillows, patchworked in sumptuous acetate velvets, paisley, calicos, and other cotton prints, plump with polyester. That's something you don't hear very often. Plump with polyester or k pop filling. All lavish with fine stitchery and quilting done by patient hands with the authentic beauty of bygone leisurely time. Made here in America, all the design, which are exclusively ours, <laughs> are faithful reproductions of historic 18th century patterns. All are treasures to use and prize now and hand down as future heirlooms. Prices range from $11 to $180 for pieces in the set. So certainly these quilts were sold through fantasy um, <laughs> of, of many kinds um, of exotic escape, uh, namely, and also domestic heritage. In reality, the quilts were the production of independent, entrepreneurial black women in Alabama. In 1969, the Freedom Quilting Bee was commissioned by the DuPont Corporation to make an extraordinary quilt. It was common practice for DuPont's Dacron 88 fiber fill material to be used as filling for quilts. The company wanted to capitalize on this practice with the biggest quilt ever made using their product. And the women agreed to make the quilt for $2,500 and DuPont provided the fabric scraps. So this is a, a photograph of, of the largest quilt at the time um, in the world with the American Eagle in the middle. Freedom Quilting Bee President Estelle Witherspoon explained how the quilt was finished and she said, we just called everybody <laughs> who could come by truck or foot or horseback and told them to get to it. End of quote. The quilters worked on it in rotations of eight people at a time. In 1969, the Freedom Quilting Bee bought their first permanent space uh, designated just for quilting and sewing. And I have a picture of the groundbreaking that's going to pop up. All right. 
Um, in March of that year, Calvin Trillin of The New Yorker wrote an article about the quilting bee that was so widely read it brought more attention to the quilters than ever before. In 1972, the quilters signed a contract with Sears, Roebuck, Roebuck and Company to sew corduroy pillow shams. The Sears contract was lucrative, and in 1982, 10 years after the collaboration began, the co-op made $200,000, the most it had ever made in a single year. Uh, the pillow shams were sewn, not quilted, and did not call for the creativity of the quilters, but it did provide steady work and more publicity to the region. Many women did not like working with corduroy, and some of them left the co-op altogether. Others continued to make quilts individually on their own time and also um, made money through the Sears contract. Uh, the Freedom Quilting Bee empowered the women individually and collectively. It brought more opportunities for daily survival and land ownership instead of rental living that made them vulnerable to the politics of angry whites. The bee provided a steady income and funding for their descendants to go to college. It made them less dependent on people who sought to exploit their labor and changed the economic relationship from one of a total dependency on the landowners and their demands for backbreaking agricultural labor and tenant farming to one uh, with more choices. The strong tradition of quilting in Alabama also rolls deep. Uh, it continues into our moment through individual and collective production. Let me not drop the remote. Um, I'm turning now to Yvonne Wells, um, who I think many of you are familiar with because of the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts um, collection. Born in Tuscaloosa, Yvonne Wells um, is an artist who's here, who's very present, um, and her collection of quilts tells a variety of narratives, um, including those that are specific about um, Alabama's civil rights history, and I'm just gonna show you a couple. She began quilting in 1979 with uh, traditional quilt patterns, and then turned to making story quilts in the 1980s. So I'm showing you here her quilt titled Civil Rights in the South, number three, uh, from 1989. Each part has a story behind it, and I'm going to just talk about some of the sections. Um, in the top left, let's see if I can, yes, right here. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through this. Um, this represents uh, the girls that were killed at the 16th Street Baptist Church, making a connection uh, with Chris McNair, who I've spoken about. Um, and Wells has marked this with the four crosses. Um, in the top center, um, we have Governor George C. Wallace's stand in the schoolhouse door that I also showed you in Chris McNair's photograph. Um, on the right is a stack of flags uh, with the Confederate flag on top, the American flag in the middle, and the state flag on the bottom. The circle of people uh, that takes up this space in this lower quadrant um, are black and white, and they surround Martin Luther King Jr. who's giving a speech in front of a, a, a shining sun. And um, just to the left of this group on the bottom is the scene of two African Americans hanging from a tree um, having just been lynched. Um, actually, no, sorry, it's just one. Um, and in the bottom left corner, corner is a representation of Rosa Parks sitting on the Montgomery City bus on December 1st, 1955, refusing to give up her seat for the comfort of a white man. Okay, here they are. Um, I'll move on to the next quilt. Wells made this quilt uh, solely about Rosa Parks' uh, contribution, calling her the first lady of quilts, so please notice her tiara. Um, with stars on her head. Her hair is a circular, a large circular shape that reads to me as a vinyl record um, or a wheel. Um, on the top of the wheel are people who walk during the bus boycott. Above her, her head on the left is a green city bus here. Um, below that is a burning cross and a Klansman topped with a white rectangular hood here and then uh, right here are um, the segregated water fountains marked uh, white on the left and then colored on the right. 
Below the wheel, a, a strip of the Confederate flag protects a group of white people um, who uh, are sitting beside a large white glove. And in the bottom left corner, a black body swings from a tree. Walsh generously combines the oral history tradition as a griot with the practical tradition of quilt making. And you can imagine, and this is something that dates back to the 19th century, quilts being used to tell stories, family histories, biblical stories, um, and stories of the supernatural. Wells's work brings together innovation and heritage to engage visitors to discover a cultural heritage that she sews into these grand textiles. So I also wanted to show you uh, just to represent the West Coast because that's where I'm from and to also um, emphasize the reach of Alabama um, across the nation. Um, the work of Noah Purifoy and not enough people know about um, Noah's work. I feel like I'm always on my soapbox trying to introduce um, artists um, who are lesser known and, and should really be celebrated. So. Um, in Joshua Tree, um, which if you go to California, you might not make it all the way to the desert. It's really worth planning a trip to Palm Springs, uh, to Joshua Tree, um, to go to the Integratron. You'll have to look that up. It's a very exciting place built on the crossroads of three rivers uh, underground. And, and go to Noah Purifoy's um, outdoor um, art museum. Um, it's, it's a really fantastic place. Noah Purifoy was born in Snow Hill, Alabama um, in 1917. He grew up the 12th of 13 children in an extremely poor sharecropper family. Following high school in Birmingham, he studied history and education at Alabama State Teachers College and taught industrial arts in Montgomery and Tuscaloosa high schools. After serving in the Navy, Purifoy earned a master's degree in social work from Atlanta University. He later worked as a social worker in Cleveland and at the Los Angeles County Hospital. He left the position to enroll in Schoenard Art Institute, now known as CalArts, in 1951, where he became the first full-time African-American student. He also became the first director of the Watts Towers Art Center and taught college in several schools in California. In 1989, Purifoy moved to the desert city of Joshua Tree, where he built an art studio now known as the Noah Purifoy Outdoor Desert Museum. So um, this is eight acres of land, um, over 100 large artworks, all made out of junk. He is most closely associated with the junk art movement um, that emerged around the time of the, uh, the Watts Rebellion in 1965 in Los Angeles. And I'm just going to show you one artwork um, to focus on, and it's white colored. In his poignant sculpture, White Colored from 2000, Purifoy reconstructs accommodations for Jim Crow segregation under makeshift conditions. Two fixtures for water, a refrigerated water fountain beneath a sign reading white, um, stands a few paces away from a toilet bowl precariously balanced on a two by four and plywood shelf. I'm gonna show you some details. Um, marked colored. Let's see if it likes me now. Okay, so here's, here's a detail of white. And then here's a detail of colored. The stage for separate but equal is clear. The components share the same presentation on a warped platform in front of a wall made of yellowed limestone-esque linoleum flooring under a sheltering overhang. Let's see, uh, let me go back to give you the big picture. There we go. Connected by a rubber hose that sags in the space between the units, the water offered may be the same, but the differences in delivery clarifies the ambitions of white supremacy in material form. Although racial segregation formally existed in California through public services, sundown towns, and educational and housing facilities, even the beaches were segregated. Um, the segregated water fountains is most closely associated with southern states. For white colored, the desert functions as a place for time and space travel. 
Is it 1955, 2000, or 2020? I'm taking these, this line of questioning from the amazing curator and scholar Kelly Jones. Um, is it Mississippi? Is it Alabama? Is it California? Is it Johannesburg? Um, Purifoy finds and assembles recognizable remnants of life to connect viewers with reality. Concerning the structure of poverty that transcends time and space, white colored forces viewers to ask questions such as what is real, what is past, and when is the future? In the desert, Jones's characterization of the West as a, a no place of utopia meets Purifoy's indictment of American corruption at the crossroads. So I, I'd like to end by showing you um, some very recent work by a San Francisco-based artist named Lava Thomas. In her series of mugshot portraits, Women of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, Thomas has recreated through oversized pencil drawings 12 photographic mugshots of women arrested for boycotting segregation here in Montgomery. Her series of approximately three by four foot drawings forces the viewer to contemplate the sacrifice and bravery required of these women. So I'm showing you here um, Jimmy L. Lowe, and I just have three of these of the 12. Easiest thing to do. Um, next, I'm showing you Ida, Mel Cald Ida May Caldwell. Viewers confront these images, the images of these women, and also the history of the civil rights movement and activism in Alabama in a way and for a longer duration that most have not done before by looking at their mugshots. There's an aspect of meditation um, in these works on the part of Thomas in her painstaking process of creating the drawings. Um, that transfer to the viewer, um, the sense of meditation transfer to the viewer in the process of looking at each of the women. And I'll show you the last one, um, Uretta F. Adair. In this way, the history is introduced to a new generation of viewers, some of whom didn't know about, about the boycott and others who may have known, but are reintroduced to the story and the people in a new way. So I'm going to end now, and just by saying that this is, again, I, and I'm almost apologizing, it's a tiny sample of the very rich artistic legacy that Alabama offers us through the visual arts related to the civil rights movement. So I thank you for your attention, um, and for the privilege, really, as an outsider, even though my parents are both from the South, um, of sharing with you some scholarship about just a handful of the many artists who are either from Alabama or have been deeply impacted by the history of the state and their work. The long tradition of beauty, resistance, and the will to live continues to inspire artists and viewers around the country and beyond. Thank you. Good? Okay. So hello again. Um, I think we have time for one question. Hey, and you, sir. Where, where is the DuPont quilt now? The one you said that was the largest one at the time. Where is it exhibited? I do not know. My guess is the Smithsonian because they own everything, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who else. I, yeah, I don't know. That's, my, that's the honest answer. I would look there first. It's like America's attic. <laughs> it's really true. <laughs> yeah.